This free presentation is brought to you by Quantum University. Hello, my name is Greg Braden. If you are watching this presentation today, what I know is that you know, this is certainly no ordinary time in the history of our world, in the history of our nation, of any nation, in the history of the people of the world. And I want you to know it's not your imagination. We are living an extraordinary time, an extraordinary time of, of change in the world around us. And what that means is that our lives are changing in ways that we simply have never seen before. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. How can we embrace this change in, in a healthy way? How can we find the resilience in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities to thrive in a healthy way in what now the experts are calling the time of extremes? So I'd like to begin uh, with a, just a, an amazing statement by a man I have tremendous respect for. Uh, his name is E.O. Wilson. He's an evolutionary biologist. And what he says about our time in history begins by saying that that we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. And that is such a powerful statement. And, and as I read this, uh, I knew that he could have stopped right there and it would have been just a, a beautiful and very accurate thing to say, but he didn't. He went on and elaborated on what he meant by this. And, and I'd like to share this as we begin our program today because what E.O. Wilson said in this statement about our time and our world, it applies to you and me and this presentation today. He said, we are drowning in information. We're starving for wisdom. The world has changed. He said, the world from this point forward is going to be run by people that he calls synthesizers. I love this. Synthesizers. A synthesizer is someone who can put together just the right information at just the right time and then think critically about what they have done and make important choices wisely. And that is precisely where you and I find ourselves in our world today. And that's what this program is all about. It's no longer enough to be an expert in only one topic or one field because we don't live our lives in a vacuum. A uh, beautiful example, I was trying to, to share with my mother how to access her emails on the computer, thinking it would be a simple thing to do, but we couldn't just get her on to the emails. She had to figure out how to turn on the computer, how to hook up the computer, how to get onto the internet, how to choose the right browser, all of these things. And, and that's just a, a simple example of what is now a, a common fact. And that is that we must know a little bit about a lot of things and be able to weave these things together to solve the problems in our lives and, and to embrace change in a healthy way. So this program certainly reflects this. It's not only about the healing in our everyday lives. I'd like to talk about the context of our lives within which the need for the healing is occurring. Something is changing in our world. And my sense, my feeling is that when the facts are clear, the choices become obvious. When the facts are clear, the choices become obvious. And ultimately, the better we know ourselves, the better equipped we are to deal with whatever life brings to our doorstep. So, so that would be the theme for everything I'm going to share in the next hour. So I want to begin just by acknowledging a couple of facts about our lives and where we are today. It is a fact that we are living a time of extremes. The experts are calling this a time of extremes. And it doesn't mean that only bad things are happening in the world or, or even good things for that matter. What they're telling us is that big things are happening, big changes in the world, and that means big changes in our lives. And I think we're all sensing that our world is changing and it's changing in ways that we have never seen. No one in this generation has witnessed the convergence of cyclic changes that we are living today, whether we're talking about climate or economy or conflict, our world is changing in ways that we've never seen. And what that means is our lives are changing quickly in ways that we're not used to. And I, I wanna be very clear when I say this, I'm not saying that this is good or bad or right or wrong. I'm not saying the change is the result of mistakes made in the past. I think we've all done the best we could with what we knew when we had to make our choices. And now the world is changing and new discoveries are giving us the reason to think differently about ourselves and our relationship to one another and our bodies and the healing that is required for us to embrace this change in a healthy way. So it is a fact now that we've got to think differently and we've got to live differently, perhaps more so than at any time in the past, so that we can be resilient. And we're not just talking about trying to, 
to find a way to, to survive. We'd like to thrive. How do we thrive in the presence of the changes? And how does that thriving reflect as the healing in our bodies in conventional and non-conventional ways, subconscious, conscious, emotional, and physical? This is all part of the healing that we're talking about here. So the world right now, we're living a time of extremes. We're talking about peak oil or peak death. We're talking about climate change or, or social change. What we now know is that the changes in the world, we can no longer separate them from the changes in our everyday lives. Maybe we thought we could at some point in the past, but it's pretty much impossible to do these things now. The, the events unfolding halfway around the world in the economy and climate, they're affecting what happens in our own living room, the price we pay for food at the grocery stores, we put it on the dinner table. They're affecting our jobs, industry, careers, and all of that is leading to a new normal. And this is important. For many people, there has been a sense that the world was kind of chugging along in a way that, that allowed it to work pretty well. There were some things that could work better. And then something happened. And for some people, that something was 9-11 or maybe it was the economic collapse of 08. Whatever it is, there was a sense that something happened. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because so many people throughout the world, in the last five years, I've been on every continent of the earth except Antarctica. There's a sense that people are waiting for things to get back to normal, back to the way things used to be, They're waiting for the, the climate to go back to the regular seasons of rain and snow and temperature that they knew when they were kids. Or they're waiting for the economy to go back to the kind of interest rates where they could prepare for sending their kids to school or, or their retirement in the way that was 15, 20, 30 years ago. They're waiting for the old normal to return. And the reason I'm saying this to you is because we are now living a new normal. The old normal cannot return because the world that supported that normal no longer exists. That world is gone. The world changed. No one really told us. It wasn't really acknowledged in the mainstream media. And this has direct applications to our healing and our health because big change in the world has to mean big change in our lives. We cannot separate those two things. Big change in the world means stress in our lives. And I'm not saying that the stress necessarily in and of itself is right, wrong, good, or bad, but it's very specific kinds of stress we're dealing with. So I'm, I'm just gonna ask a, a question that uh, I am often asked when I'm at a live event. People ask me all the time. They say, why do we typically die between the age of 70 and 100 years of age? And at first it might seem like a, a, a silly question to some people because they'll say, well, old age, or you know, they'll say, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. But the new science, the best science of our time, is now telling us that our bodies have this extraordinary ability to heal, even in ways that we have been conditioned to believe they could not, in ways that we were taught they could not in our lifetimes, in the medical schools, in the classrooms, in the textbooks, in the mainstream documentaries. Every organ in our body now has been documented with the ability to heal itself. Every cell, every kind of cell in our body is now documented with the ability to heal itself, even those we were told could not. Pancreatic cells, brain cells, heart cells, spinal cord tissue, all of these things are now documented with the ability to heal themselves, but the key is that they must be given the right environment. They must be given the right conditions to do this. So with these discoveries in mind, now that it is a fact that our body has the ability to heal itself and also reverse aging. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. Now this question actually takes on even greater meaning. If we have this ability, why do we typically die between 70 and 100 years? Why is that the typical lifespan of an adult in the Western world? And the answer, the answer is very powerful. The, the leading cause of deaths in adults over 65 in the Western world, we know is heart disease, what we call heart disease. When I first began to understand this, my question was, what does that mean? You know, when you say heart disease, it sounds like a catch-all for a lot of things that either aren't understood or are understood and maybe too complex to, to put into the answer. What is heart disease? And this is when I went to the open literature, the amazing work of, uh, of James Blumenthal. And I have so much respect for this man from, uh, from Duke University. He is a pioneer in making the kinds of relationships between mind and body that we're going to be talking about here. What James Blumenthal said was that heart disease, it's defined physically, 
those things we all are familiar with, high blood pressure, vascular plaque, stroke, we all know about those things. But then he went a step further and he linked these physical conditions to non-physical experiences. He said that the heart disease results from long-term experiences of fear, frustration, anxiety, disappointment, a long term. So what he's saying to us is that it's stress. It is the stress from fear, the stress of the frustration or the anxiety or disappointment. And I want to be really clear. I don't want to leave you with the feeling that stress has to be a bad thing. There are, are positive, good kinds of stress. There are negative, bad kinds of stress. There's constructive stress. There's destructive stress. The key here is where he says long term. So what Blumenthal is talking about, when he talks about the stress, it's not the stress that's the problem, it's unresolved stress. If we allow the stress to continue in our minds and our bodies, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, that's where the problem comes in. And the new science now is telling us precisely why this is. So the unresolved stress from anything is what is leading to the disease that steals from us, the very thing that we cherish the most, and that is life itself. So this 70 to 100 years, that appears to be how long this magnificent organ, our hearts, can hold up under the pressure of unresolved stress. If we don't know how to deal with the experiences of change, the 70 to 100 years It's like stretching a rubber band. This is how long the rubber band can be stretched until it simply gives out. Something has to give. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating, and this would be interesting at any time, but now we've opened within a larger context. The world is changing. It's changing in ways that we've never seen, in ways that we're not used to. And those changes, if we do not have the tools to embrace the change in a healthy way, if we do not understand why the change is happening, If we don't understand where we fit into the change and see light at the end of the tunnel and know how to make life better for ourselves, that's stress. And that is what's killing people that we love, our friends, our families. That is what's stealing from us the very thing that we cherish the most. So resilience. Resilience is the key when we're dealing with with any kind of, of change. And I know that resilience, the word itself, means different things to different people. Textbook. Uh, discussions of resilience typically describe the ability to bounce back or to spring back to a normal functioning after uh, a time of of distress. So a family loses a loved one uh, in a battlefield in Afghanistan, halfway around the world. Um, Parents lose their son or their daughter. Brothers and sisters lose their siblings. Husbands and wives lose husbands and wives. And they must find the resilience to move on with life after that loss, after that trauma. So so that's one form of resilience. We've all experienced it. I think it's a good definition. When I began studying the principles of resilience, I want to know if there is more. Is, Is there more than the ability to bounce or spring back? And the Stockholm Resilience Institute is actually studying uh, what is now being called expanded resilience. And it's the kind of resilience where we think and live each day in a way that allows us to embrace the obvious change that is upon us so that we don't have to spring back or bounce back. We've already accounted for that change in our lives. And that's, that's the kind of resilience that I'm talking about here. The Institute of Heart Math is a pioneering research center in, um, in Northern California. Uh, I'm not their employee. I want to be very clear about that. But I know them very well. and I've worked with them for over 20 years. I've worked with people at, uh, at HeartMath. They are a pioneering research organization made of medical doctors, scientists, engineers, chemists, physicists, uh, computer scientists that have left their respective professions to come together and pool their talent to explore the power of the human heart in unconventional ways. So we all know that the heart can pump blood. But you can build a machine to do that. The question is, what else? What else does our heart do? That's what the Institute of Heart Math is all about. So they're sharing some of their information with me, and I'm sharing some of it with you here today. And and, uh, what you're seeing right now is a a study of resilience uh, that they performed. And it applies to all of us in our lives in one form or another. It was a 60-day study. And what they're showing is that when we are presented 
with uh, a new experience in life. We have to rise the occasion and, and figure out something new and, and how to perform differently. That we typically go through uh, a series of stages. And you can see the stages in front of you. Usually the first 10 days, whatever this new experience is, we're usually up for it. You know, we're, we're out there, uh, we're embracing it, we're researching it, we've got the energy to, to deal with a new change. As I'm saying this to you now, um, I'll just share a personal experience that applies to this because it's very present with me right now. Uh, my mother is, uh, uh, her health is declining very quickly and I am now her primary uh, caregiver, um, her power of attorney. I'm responsible for her life, her finances, for all of her medical, all of those things. And, and the reason I'm saying this is because when it began, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't see it coming. And I hear people say that a lot uh, when they get to be... Uh, you know, in, uh, in middle age, um, somehow I thought mom and I would have more time together. So when her condition became apparent to me, I'm a scientist, I'm a researcher, I'm a scholar. So these first 10 days, that's exactly what I was doing. I was up for the challenge. I was, the, I was on the internet. I was researching, looking for solutions, looking for options of uh, how we were going to deal with this. So I identify with this, this very, very well. First 10 days. After about those 10 days to, uh, to uh, a little over a week, uh, you know, week and a half, something like that, there was a plateau that usually lasts for the next uh, 30 days. So from 10 to 30 days, I'm sorry, with the next 20 days, uh, where we, we reach what's called a maximum efficiency. So we're just kind of hanging in there, and, and that's what I was doing. I was studying, and I was getting familiar with the language and the lingo and the diagnostics and the possibilities and, and all the things that can happen. Then typically people begin going into what's called a hyperreactive stage. And hyperreaction means we begin to be function less optimally, begin to break down. We're, we're tired, and that eventually goes into what's called emotional exhaustion at the end of that 60-day cycle. Okay, I identify with this curve, and what you're seeing on the screen, the red line is a typical curve for most of us. Uh, you know, we work along those lines. The first 10 days... I identified with that very closely. The plateau I identified very closely. When I felt myself moving into this hyper-reactive stage, I began applying techniques I'm going to talk about here today so that I would not go into the emotional exhaustion as people typically do when they don't have the techniques. So what we're talking about is a curve of resilience. The red line shows a curve of resilience. Now I'm going to show you a blue line. It is another curve of resilience that is elevated, and that's my goal here today through the information that I'm sharing, is that we learn uh, the tools and the techniques to elevate our, our curve of, of resilience. We're not going to change what's happening in the world. We can definitely change how we respond to what's happening in the world. And this is how we learn to embrace that change in a healthy way. So with my mom, uh, I began applying these techniques, and uh, it's been five years now. And I feel like I'm dealing with the change as well. I'm respecting her wishes and uh, doing all that I can to support her in the process that she's going through. And these tools have helped me invaluably. So that's one of the reasons I can speak about it very confidently because I've experienced them personally. So I can look you right in the eye and say, I know this stuff works. So I want to just take about a half a step back. I've said the world is going through a lot of big changes right now. And that, for some people, that can be frightening. So I wanted to share some good news. I even put the good news on the screen. It says good news. <laughs> Part of the good news is that we already have all the solutions to the big problems in the world today, the technological solutions. And that comes as a surprise to a lot of people. They say, uh, you know, when's somebody going to figure out how to create, the, you know, the energy that we need or how to grow the food we need or, you know, how to fix the economy or whatever. The good news is we already have those answers. We already know how to deal with all of the problems. We know how to grow the food and we have enough food to feed every mouth of every child, every man, every woman on the face of the earth today. We already know how to create the energy to bring electricity into every home of every family that wants it in the world. Not every family wants it. And we know how to do it with zero greenhouse gases. We know how to do it affordably. We know how to do it sustainably. We know how to create the medical model in our lives that relies upon the body's ability and the body's wisdom to heal itself and integrates that with the best science and the technology of today. We already have these things. So the question is, if we have them, people say to me all the time, where are those solutions today? And, and that's, that is the issue. 
the issue is not the solutions. It's the thinking that makes these issues a priority, and the solutions are priority in our lives. The, the thinking that allows us to embrace these in our lives today. And, and the key is simply this. My strong feeling is that the better we know ourselves, the better we can embrace whatever life brings to our doorstep, whatever life's extremes come our way. If we know ourselves, if we know who we are, we know our capabilities, we know how to access these inner abilities that our ancestors talked about and sometimes seem like fairy tales to us. If we know the science that allows us to embrace these things, how do we kick up our immune system to amazing levels? How do we trigger those anti-aging hormones in our body and live to advanced ages? How do we trigger the 1300 biochemical reactions that are all related in our body that give us optimum health and healing no matter what's happening in our lives? The better we know ourselves, the better we can embrace those changes. So for me, as a scientist, there's one question that I feel holds the key to all of these things. So, so I'm going to go a little detour briefly to what some people feel maybe is an esoteric tangent, but for me, it is exactly the, the information that leads us to our, our greatest path of strength and our greatest ability. There's one question that holds the key to thinking differently. So if I said to you that the way you answer one question holds the key, it's the reason for every decision you've ever made in your life, would, would you want to know what that is? If, if I said that that same question, the way you answer that question, it's the basis for every choice that you have ever made in your life. When you accepted the job, when you declined the job, when you said yes to a relationship, when you said no, when you said yes to a, a medical procedure, when you said no to a medical procedure, would you want to know what that is? If I said, the way you answer a single question it's at the heart of every challenge that has ever passed your life, that is past crossing your path right now, that, that will ever cross your path in the future. I said, the way you answer this one question holds the key. Would you want to know what that question is? And of course, I think we all say yes. We say, well, what is that question? And the answer is deceptively simple. So please do not be deceived by the simplicity of the answer you're going to see. The question that holds the key to thinking differently for every decision we've ever made, every choice we've ever made, every challenge that's ever crossed our paths and how we deal with it, the question is simply this. Every human who has ever walked the earth has had to answer this for themselves in one way or another, consciously or subconsciously. Question, who am I? Who am I? Who am I in this world? What does this really mean? And because there are many of us, the question becomes, who are we? Who are we in this world? Where do we fit? What is our relationship to the world around us? So this is where I want to go just for a moment because it's going to lead us into the science, directly into the science that takes us to the discoveries that allow us to optimize this healing in our bodies. Who are we? It matters for a very important reason. And if you've never thought about this, I'm going to invite you to do so just for a moment. The way you answer the question, who am I? For yourself, the way you answer that, it forms a lens, a filter, if you will, through which you see yourself and through which you will see every other person in the world and everything that happens to you in life. It forms a filter through which you will perceive and interpret all of the things that happen to you, your friends, your husband, your wife, your siblings, your loved ones. Uh, the way you perceive what's happening in the news around you, the way you perceive the way your body functions, the way you say, who am I? The way you answer that question is going to form that lens. So all of a sudden, this question becomes really important. I don't know what could be more important. Who are we? Well, what I can say to you right now is that we are not what we have been told, and we are much, much more than we've ever imagined. And it gives me tremendous joy to be able to share some of the reasons why this is true with you today. I uh, mentioned that I'm a scientist. I'm, uh, my degree's in geology and the earth sciences, and to get to that degree, I had to study a lot of other sciences, marine biology, marine geology, computer science, physics, chemistry, mathematics, uh, ocean science. And all of those have actually worked together really well to help me think of the world maybe a little bit differently, and to, to see the world a little bit differently. It's more than these compartmentalized boxes of, of physics, chemistry, geology, and biology. It's the integration of all of these sciences together into the, in the life, something that works for us. So I have spent 
much of my adult life exploring the most ancient and cherished wisdom traditions of those who have come before us, of our ancestors. Because I wanted to see how they have dealt in their time with the problems they experienced. Many of their problems are very similar to ours today. Our ancestors had to deal with climate change, for example, big changes in their lives, and they didn't have a lot of the technology that we have today. How did they do it? How did they embrace that change? We know they were resilient because they're, they lasted long enough for us to be here. So how did they do this? What did they know in their time? Maybe that we've forgotten in ours, and what did they know that maybe we have never known about us and our relationship to the world? My journey has taken me to some of the most isolated, magnificent, beautiful, pristine, and remote places remaining on the earth today. Uh, because my sense has always been that the more intact information would be found in places least disturbed by the modern world. So for that reason, I've made it a point to go to places where a lot of people simply don't go and where the modern world simply hasn't caught up yet. And my journey has taken me, it has taken me in some of the most magnificent monasteries. The one you're seeing on the screen is uh, in Tibet, it's almost 17,000 feet above sea level in the, uh, in the highlands of the, of the uh, Tibetan plateau on, uh, in central China, or central Tibet. Uh, it's taken me into, into some of the most primitive and ancient monasteries. The one you're seeing right now is, is in the mountains of Egypt on the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, this monastery has been here for 15 years, and it holds a library of records second only to the Vatican in terms of, of ancient and pre-Christian traditions, and many of them are regarding health and healing. This is fascinating to me. When, when the ancient sect that is called the Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S, when they first showed up in this part of the world, in Egypt, uh, before the time of Jesus, before the time of, uh, of Christ, uh, the Egyptians had a word for them that immediately caught my interest. The Egyptians did not call them the Essenes. They called them therapeutae. They called them therapeutae because these people knew about healing. They knew how to create what appeared at that time to be miraculous healings because they understood the relationship between one human body and another, between us and the earth. And they understood what the human body was attempting to do in the healing process. And that kind of information is preserved in the records in the, the libraries and monasteries like the one you're seeing on the screen right now. So I've made it a point to go to these places, to study the texts and the records themselves, because that is where the data is found from those who have come before us. You know, science, uh, science is a relatively new way of thinking about the world. It's only about 300 years old. Science is good. Uh, I think we all agree that the best science of our time is incomplete. There are glaring inconsistencies and gaps in the scientific understanding of us and our relationship to the world. So my question was, science is 300 years old. People have been here a lot longer than 300 years. What did we know before science? So we have 5,000 years of human experience and indigenous wisdom and, and mystical traditions that have been preserved in places like I'm sharing with you now. Uh, when we find that information, it helps us to understand the missing pieces. And then we can use the science of today to validate and confirm and, and fill in what that means in our lives and our bodies. You're going to see this in just a few minutes. But in addition to sharing time with those who preserve the records, it's been important for me to live and share time with the people who live the traditions, with the monks and the nuns and the abbots of the monasteries, with the, the shaman and the curandaros and the healers of of the Andes Mountains of, of, of Peru and Bolivia and Nepal and India. These are the people that live the traditions every day in their lives that are recorded in those, in those texts. And it's by spending time with them. And I've been with these people when there are revolutions in the country, um, when their loved ones have been killed, when their children have been born. I've been with them when there's healing happening in the families and we've shared meals together. And it's these these very human experiences between us that allow a bond uh, of friendship and trust and camaraderie. And in that trust is the confidence to ask the questions of the deepest mysteries 
And because that trust is there, they're willing to share. So when I ask these people, when I ask the, the monks and the nuns, how do you create these miraculous healings in your body? I've been with monks and nuns over 120 years old. We can validate it in their, in their papers, but they don't look 120. And I ask them, what do you do in your lives to, to give you your longevity? And it's because we have the trust that they are comfortable sharing with me. And they'll take me in the library and they'll say, in this passage, it says to think and to feel in a certain way and to eat these things. And we do this. So I'm sharing all of this because this is part of the synthesis that I mentioned at the very beginning of this program. We live in a world that's changing very quickly. And the science is good, but the science is incomplete in some places. Our ancestors had answers and understandings that we can merit, uh, melt. I was going to say marry. We can marry into the science. We can meld into the science. Uh, and I think this is the value of this kind of summit that we're doing here today. And I so appreciate the opportunity to, to, uh, to participate and contribute to this summit. Because we have an advantage that our ancestors never had. Our ancestors had the wisdom, the indigenous earth-based wisdom of their time that helped them. And, and we have modern science of our time that helps us. Both we know are incomplete. When I was in the corporations as a scientist, as an engineer, I was told I had to make a choice. I had to choose a path of either science or spirituality. They actually told me that I could not serve two masters. It sounded almost religious. Greg, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve science and spiritual or ancient uh, wisdom path. So you must choose. And I asked a question in return. I said, what if I don't make that choice? What if I don't choose science or spirituality? What if we don't as a society? What if instead we marry these two great ways of knowing into a wisdom that is more than either can be individually? What if we marry the best science of the 21st century with 5,000 years of wisdom of our past into a wisdom that gives us something greater than either could do individually? Where does that lead us? And that is precisely what we're talking about here today. So that's why I wanted to take this little, little detour and just talk to you a little bit about why I feel it's important to, to marry so many different ways, to synthesize so many different ways of knowing and so many different experiences to bring them to bear upon our lives in the healthiest way possible. So for 5,000 years, our ancestors answered the question, who are we? They did it in a way that made sense to them. Science, as I mentioned, is only 300 years old. Science is trying to answer big questions in life. In the last 150 years, since the time of Charles Darwin, science has told us a story. So when you were in school, when I was in school, if you were in school in the West, if you were in a public school in the West, you were steeped in the same story that I was steeped in and the story that our young people are being steeped in today. It's a story of separation, competition, and conflict. Modern science, when they ask the question, who are we? They attempt to answer this question by answering what are called the six perennial questions of life. I'm sharing them with you on this inverted pyramid. And the, the first question begins, it's the foundation at the very bottom of the pyramid. The first question, what is the origin of life? I'm going to run through these six questions quickly. And then on the left side, I'm going to share with you what science has told us in the past. On the right side, I'm going to share with you what the best science of the 21st century is now telling us. And that will lead us into the discovery that helps us to heal our bodies in new and exciting ways and helps us to create that resilience in our lives that we've been talking about. So who are we? The first question, what is the origin of life? Where does life come from? The second question what is the origin of human life? And people say, well, isn't that the same as the first? Maybe, maybe not. There are schools of thought that say that human life has come from someplace other than the origin of all other life. So that's why this is one of the perennial questions. Third question, what is our relationship to our body? Are we separate and powerless when it comes to healing our bodies? Or are we somehow deeply connected? Do we have the ability to influence our bodies? And I'm using that word very consciously. I'm not talking about control or manipulation talking about the ability to influence the healing and the health and the, the quality of life in our bodies. The next question is, where does our relationship to the world beyond our bodies? And the same, same statements apply. Are we separate from our world? Are we connected? Do we have the ability to influence, not control or manipulate, but influence what happens in the world around us? The next question, what is our relationship to the past? Are we at the pinnacle of technological sophistication 
it's something that's happened only once. We began primitive, and now we are at this place where we have iPads, iPods, the internet. Are we at this pinnacle of sophistication, or are we living in a cyclic experience of civilizations? What is our relationship to the past? And the last question, what is the fundamental rule of nature? What is the rule that nature is based upon? All right, these are the questions. The last 150 years, we have been taught that the origin of life is random. Uh, and this is the big controversy now because the data simply is not supporting this. But this is what we have been taught. The physical data no longer supports this, that all life came from a single organism. The origin of human life, we've been taught that that is random. The DNA does not support that all life came from a single organism. What is our relationship to our bodies? We've been taught that we are separate from our bodies, that we are essentially powerless when it comes to healing our bodies or influencing the healing of our bodies. I, I remember the very first time I really got this. Uh, I was a competitive runner for years and I was living in Denver, Colorado, uh, working as a geologist. And um, for the first time I had an injury to my, to my knee. And I remember I went to the doctor and I was sitting up on the table, he was examining my knee. And just in passing, I believe that he thought the same way that I did. So I asked the doctor, I said, what is it, what is it that I can feel? that might help my knee to heal a little bit better? How could I feel differently in my body that would affect the healing of, uh, of my knee so I can run in a race in, in 10 days? And the, I remember the doctor looked up at me and he said, son, <laughs> he said, you can feel whatever you wanna feel. It's not gonna make a damn bit of difference when it comes to healing your knee. And I immediately thought, ooh, the wrong doctor. <laughs> but it was obvious that he had a very different uh, way of thinking about us and our relationship to the body. And this is what we've been conditioned to believe. We're separate from our body. Our relationship to the world, we've been taught that we're separate from the world around us, that we must somehow defend ourselves from the elements of nature, the very elements that we are part of that make up our bodies, our relationship to the past. We've been taught that civilization is linear. It began primitive about 5,000 years ago, and now it, is, it has uh, evolved into the the sophistication that we see today, and it was a one-time deal, and that we are at the pinnacle of that sophistication, we have been taught the fundamental rule of nature is competition, that nature is based upon this model of competition and conflict. This is Darwin's idea again. So if you're taking notes and you're writing these down on this side of your, of your, your paper, or on this side of the screen, if you call these false assumptions, because every one of these through peer-reviewed science is now acknowledged to be a false assumption, and then you can draw one of these right through it <laughs> because these ideas are no longer true. They're still being taught in the classrooms. They're still being taught in the textbooks. These are the ideas of separation and conflict that emerged in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And people say, why is that important today? Here's the reason. It's a good question because our society is based upon these principles and our medical and healing models are based upon these principles. The economy that is no longer working for much of the world is based on unsustainable principles that you see here of, of competition uh, and conflict. Corporations are based on these unsustainable principles and the model of healing from our bodies by not addressing the cause but trying to fix the symptom is unsustainable. That's why we see the epidemics that we're seeing today. The good news, new discoveries. New discoveries have overturned all of these ideas. We now know that the origin of life is not random. The physical evidence doesn't support it. It shows us that there's something much, much deeper happening here. In longer programs, we could go into it in more detail. Uh, the origin of human life is not random. Uh, the DNA is telling us this. Uh, the relationship to our body, we are deeply connected to our bodies. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs between our heart and our brain, as we'll see in a moment, trigger the chemistry that is released into the body. And that conversation between the heart and the brain is based on the way we feel, on our emotions. Whereas our relationship to the world, we are deeply connected and we have the ability to influence, not control or manipulate, but influence the world around us. Our relationship to the past, we now know that civilization, advanced technological civilizations are cyclic, they're not linear. And the date of the earliest civilizations now, scientific data now is confirming, it's over twice as old as what we've been led to believe. Back into the last ice age, about 13,000 years ago, and one of the sites that is a hallmark of this is the site that is called Gobekli Tepe. It is in Syria. I'm sorry, it's in Turkey near the Syrian border, a very difficult place right now. Gobekli Tepe. Uh, and the last item that plays such a powerful role in our communities and our families, 
the best science of the 21st century is now telling us the fundamental rule of nature. It's not based on competition and conflict. It's based on cooperation and mutual aid. Now, I know these are big claims. I've gone through these quickly, and I haven't backed these up in this brief presentation. I want you to know the bibliography of a 2010 release that is entitled Deep Truth, uh, a Hay House book uh, that I released in 2010. If you go to the bibliography, peer-reviewed science will share with you, will, will describe for you where all those statements come from. What I want you to see right now is that we are living a new world. We are moving from the false assumptions to the new discoveries. We are living from a world, moving from a world of separation and thinking of ourselves as separate from our bodies and our world to a world of connection. We're moving from a world of, of competition and conflict that is no longer sustainable, is not helping us to solve the problems in our bodies or the world beyond our bodies into a world of cooperation and mutual aid. The reason I'm saying this, if you find yourself in a place where the old ideas of what you and I were taught no longer work and they can't solve the problems that you're facing in life, I'm gonna invite you to let them go, come to the new discoveries the discoveries of cooperation and mutual aid. And I think you'll be surprised at how well these ideas are adapted in everything from the economy to medicine to natural healing and the healing of our bodies. And that's what I want to talk about now. Because the story of our life is changing. All things are connected now. We know all things are important now. We were told that we live in a world where atoms are things rotating around other things. Now we know that's not true. This is an image of a quantum atom. It's not things, it's fields of energy. Fields of energy that are pulsing and vibrating in very specific ways. We were taught that when we look in the heavens and they're the night sky, that the stars and the galaxies are all separate from one another. And that's what we're conditioned to thinking. This is an image through the Hubble Space Telescope, looking at the center of the universe where those two arrows are and it's easy to think why everything might be separate. But look at this, the same image, the same image through another telescope, through the Chandra space probe, is not looking optically. It's sensing fields and patterns of energy. And all of a sudden, we see everything is connected. Everything is connected. And this is what we now know. It's all energy. Einstein told us this early in the 20th century. We are that energy. The image you're seeing on the screen is actually... Uh, from a study showing the light being emitted by photons from the human body, the light from the human body. We are energy. And that idea is just now awakening in the mainstream practice of the way we address life and healing in our bodies and longevity and health in our families. It's just now emerging. Everything is energy. Everything is connected. And that very idea is leading to I, what I believe, and I'm, I'm so excited about this, is probably one of the most profound discoveries of the 20th century and now the 21st century. A discovery made in 1991. Uh, it was a discovery of specialized cells in the human body, specifically in the heart, uh, called sensory neurites. Sensory neurites in 1991 there was discovery of about 40,000 of these specialized cells, sensory neurites, located in the heart. Now, a sensory neurite, it's, it's a neural-like tissue, but it's not in the brain. It has many of the functions that we find of neurons in the brain. It's located in the heart, and it's actually being called now the little brain in the heart. So just very clearly, what I'm talking about here is two separate organs, the heart and the brain, separate organs. Each of them have a neural network that can function independently, but the key to many of the things that I'm talking about here, to the ancient wisdom, to longevity, to anti-aging hormones, to powerful, powerful states of, of, uh, of immunity, is when we connect these two neural networks together. When we connect the neural network of the heart and the brain together. The heart has its own brain. It's actually being called the little brain in the heart. And that has led to what is now being called heart intelligence, the reason it's being called heart intelligence is because these cells in the heart, they actually work independently. They can of the, the cells in the brain. They can learn, they can remember, they can feel, they can sense. They have their own way of thinking and remembering. It's different from the brain, from the cranial brain. So just to be very clear, this, this network of neurons in the heart, it is separate from the brain 
and it can work independently of the brain, and it can also be taught to be connected to the brain for one larger potent neural network. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Uh, this was discovered in uh, uh, 1991. It was actually published in the journal Neurocardiology, 1994, if you'd like to, to read the articles. And I love the name of the man who made the discovery of the little brain in the heart. His name is Armour, Armour which essentially means uh, uh, love in many different languages. So I think it's probably no accident that, uh, uh, that his destiny has led him to the place that it has led him. So once this discovery was made, of these cells in the heart. Scientists also found that there are similar networks in other organs of the body. However, they do not exist in the same concentration as they do in the heart. So what I'm saying is there's a little brain in the heart and there's also even a smaller brain in other organs of the body, uh, in the gut, for example, uh, in, in individual, individual organs, uh, kidneys, liver, uh, lungs. So we suddenly find that our body is connected through a network of intelligence uh, and it is regulated by what is happening in the heart. And that is where our feelings and emotions come in. The way that we feel, the way that we emote is the language that this network understands. Suddenly the ancient wisdom becomes very, very important because the science is telling us that the network exists. But the scientists are saying, okay, what do we do with this? I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. That's where the, our ancestors, they didn't necessarily know how the network existed, but they said, we know it's there, and here's how you apply it in your lives. Science has had 300 years to establish the, the networks and the connections that help us to understand this. Our ancestors give us 5,000 years of applying these things in our lives. I wanted you to see what a sensory neurite looks like. This on the screen is uh, under a slide. It's stained uh, on a slide. This is one neuron, one of these sensory neurites. And you can see very clearly the, the little dendrites that are uh, moving away uh, from the single cell when many of them are connected. This is what the neurons look like when they're connected. And it's through these connections. This is what we call learning. When these neurons come together, we are learning or we are remembering, creating and anchoring a memory. Uh, and when they come apart, that is when we are forgetting. So this has implications in terms of, of things like dementia and Alzheimer's. It also has implications in terms of consciously severing these connections so that we may have less connection to the things that have hurt us, hurtful memories in the past. When those connections are broken, it's called pruning. So we're talking about a pruning of these neural connections. The key here is the heart brain and the cranial brain. These two, two brains, the separate networks, but they work together. They communicate with the body and the evidence suggests they even communicate beyond the body. So this is, uh, this is the beginning, I think, of, of a, a brand new science, a new science. Uh, uh, how do we access the intelligence of the heart? Uh, I know I'm covering a lot of ground here. I'm moving quickly and just barely scratching the surface of what's possible here. But I want to talk to you a little bit about this heart intelligence. Now that we know this neural network exists between the heart and the brain, when we learn to connect them, it gives us all kinds of abilities. The heart intelligence, it's very, very fast. The heart thinks differently than the brain. Maybe you can intuit why that would be, because the heart does not go through the filters that the brain goes through to come to a decision or to make a choice or to access information. The heart does not go through the filters of ego, uh, of, of self-value, of self-worth, of hurt, uh, of anger, of frustration. The heart doesn't do that. So heart intelligence, it's very, very fast. Boom. The information is right there. When you ask your heart something in, in this connection, the answer is right there. The heart-brain connection, it is a hotline to the subconscious. And this is important because so many of the patterns uh, that hurt us, so many of the patterns of disease in the human body, people would never consciously create those things, of course. But there are subconscious programming within all of us, from the time we are born until we're seven years old. We are in a hypnagogic trance. We are sponges for patterns of information. We have no filters. So if we are in an environment that gives us good, good patterns, that's good. If we're in a, uh, an environment with parents or in a society in, in wartime, for example, in the middle of a war zone, or with people who haven't learned the tools of emotional self-regulation, then we can pick up those patterns and they can lead to disease later in life. Um, more on that in just a moment. 
So this connection, it's a conduit to the subconscious, is a conduit to very deep states of, of intuition, intentional intuition. We've all had moments where the intuition has come to us uh, 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 spontaneously. And we say, oh, I suddenly have a vision and I understand everything in the universe. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> How does that happen? It's this connection where we can trigger these consciously at will and maintain the connections, creating what we now call super learning, moving into gamma states of brain activity, very high states of brain activity, and even states of precognition. The studies are showing where the heart anticipates an event that is going to be emotionally significant before the event ever happens. This is very well documented in the scientific literature. There's a, a lot of, of controversy about how and why it happens, but there's no controversy the fact that it is happening under laboratory conditions and in life. And if you're not into any of those things, just making this connection, it's a trigger for over 1,300 biochemical reactions in the body. Uh, and these include things like anti-aging hormones, uh, the immune response, mood regulation, cardiovascular health, all of those things. Heart intelligence is very, very fast. And I just wanted to give you a quick example, the power of 180 seconds. Because the studies have shown that we know within 180 seconds, that's about three minutes. It is exactly three minutes, 60 seconds times three. We know within three minutes when the person in our presence is a potential compatible life mate, uh, uh, sustainable compatible life mate for, forever. We know that within 180 seconds, our heart knows it. However, we will often discount what our heart tells us and we will enter into a, a, a personal relationship, a romantic relationship, a business relationship, a job, a friendship. Even when our heart says this may not be the best thing, because we discount that experience and we tend to think with our mind and we make all kinds of excuses and exceptions ab about why we think this may be successful. But the heart knows in 180 seconds. So in 180 seconds, we know if we've got the right partner. Sometimes we take 10 or 20 years for the life experience to catch up with us and say, oh, maybe that wasn't the best decision. Or maybe it was. So heart intelligence, very, very fast. Deep states of intuition. I wanted you to see what this looks like. What you're seeing on the screen is a, a scan of brain waves, and you're seeing in the center of the screen a big dip in the brain waves because something has grabbed the brain's attention. Because this was under laboratory conditions, we now know what it was. It was a heartbeat. It was the R wave, the peak wave of a heartbeat, grabbing the attention of the brain waves. This is showing us a beautiful example of when we are in that optimum connection. This is the heart communicating with the brain. Those brain waves are what you're seeing on the left side of the screen. This is the heart-brain connection. And when you have that, that is you connecting to your subconscious, you connecting to um, making powerful affirmations that your body understands, you having deep states of intuition. So all of these things are possible. This is why this, this connection is, is so powerful. It's why I'm, I'm so excited to share this with you and talk to you about it but that goes beyond our physical body. What you're seeing on the screen is a brainwave of a mother who has given birth to a baby. The baby is in another room uh, in the same building. You're seeing again, a big dip in the mother's brainwave. And the scientists are saying, what is the brain responding to? Well, because it's under laboratory conditions, they can tell that the mother's brain is responding to the baby's heartbeat in another part of the house. So even though they are not physically connected, the last graph was for one individual, heart-brain connection for an individual. This is the baby's heartbeat showing up in the mother's brain waves. This is how a mother knows when her child needs something. This is the deep connection that a mother will have with her children all of her life, whether they're in the same house or in the same room or they're in a battlefield halfway around the world. Parents know when their kids are in trouble and, and when, they're, when good things are happening as well. It's not all about bad things. And this helps us to understand why this is. It's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing to see what this means. So this heart intelligence, fast conduit to subconscious, deep intuition to trigger for these biochemical reactions in our bodies, and it goes even further than that. Now, I mentioned earlier in the program, our world is changing, and that change can be stressful. We don't know how to deal with that change. One of the ways of dealing with the change is consciously linking the heart and the brain. We're going to talk about that briefly in just a moment. But it's that stress that is unresolved that actually is now being viewed as responsible for old age and even death. This is 
uh, from the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences 2004 is that the end of the DNA, the telomeres at the end of the DNA, uh, as they shorten, we call it uh, senescence, uh, and as they shorten enough, they may can no longer reproduce in a healthy way, we call that death. Their finding is unresolved stress, chronic stress is actually shortening the telomeres at the end of the DNA as they go through the cell division. So this is science telling us that stress is killing and it doesn't have to because we now have the technology to know what to deal with this. The longer those telomeres are at the end of the DNA, the longer we live life and the healthier we can be. All right, so how do we optimize this heart-brain connection? I mentioned the Institute of Heart Math just a moment ago. And they've done some amazing studies and, and among those studies is exploring the conversation between the heart and the brain. Every moment of every day, the heart is sending information to the brain and the brain is responding and sending information back to the heart. The big conversations between the heart and the brain, the lesser conversation is from the brain back to the heart. The way we feel in our heart determines the quality of the signal to our brain. So what you're seeing on the screen right now, for example, we feel experiences of anger, hate, jealousy, rage, frustration, you see a very chaotic signal going from the heart to the brain, and the brain releases chaotic chemistry into the body uh, that we would call stress chemistry, high levels of, of cortisol and adrenaline. So for someone consciously or subconsciously who doesn't feel safe or who feels uh, that they're always threatened or they need to be hypervigilant in life, or for someone who can never seem to achieve the goals of the day, we're drowning in information, as we said at the beginning of the program. If you're Go to bed at night and you know there's 100 emails that you haven't responded to and you're feeling the stress of that. This is the kind of, that, uh, of signal you're sending to your brain. It, it stirs the triggers, uh, adrenaline, cortisol, uh, that floods into the body, which is okay for short term. You don't want to live your life that way. The flip side is true as well. When we can feel emotions of appreciation, gratitude, care, compassion, the signal changes very, very quickly. And that signal to the brain tells the brain, ah, it's safe in my world. So I don't have to prepare for fight or flight in the stress chemistry. Now I can put all of my energy into supporting the immune system. I can put all of my energy into the anti-aging hormones and hormonal balance in the body and optimal cognitive response, thinking and feeling really, really well, performing well quickly. Uh, athletes, are able to do this, people, uh, uh, healers are able to do this. It's this state on the right-hand side, that is the state that triggers the optimal healing in the body and that relieves the stress, relieves the stress that we talked about in the beginning of the program. So to the degree that we can create these experiences in our heart, and there are specific techniques uh, available through the Institute of Heart Math, www.heartmath.org. And if you have not looked at their websites, I invite you to go, it's all free, look at the research, look at the data that tells you about who you are and what your heart is capable of in this conversation between your heart and your brain. You owe it to yourself to understand this facet of your being so that you can optimize your life and your body so you can be vital and present for those that you love and care for and, and for yourself and, and all of your life experiences. And as we mentioned earlier, we're living in a time of extremes. So as we embrace these extremes in a healthy way, this experience that is called coherence. Coherence is what this is called. The optimum conversation between the heart and the brain is a very low frequency. Hertz, it's 0.1 hertz. And that 0.1 hertz allows us this optimal conversation, this optimization between the heart and the brain. And it does so many things. This coherence, the more coherence we create, the optimum the communication between the heart and the brain. The more coherence we create, uh, the optimum uh, experience of intuition. This is where our deep states of intuition come from. You create that coherence and you go into your heart and you ask the questions that are important to you about your life and decisions that you're making. The greater coherence you set up, the optimal immune response. This is how you trigger the powerful, powerful immune response that allows you to travel and, and go to new parts of the world and see and experience things that maybe you haven't been able to in the past. The more coherence you have, optimal balance of biochemistry in your body, hormonal balance, uh, cholesterol, heart, 
rate variability, all of these things. And that's what we're going to talk about right here. I'm just going to say this very, very quickly. The more that we can create this coherence, the more resilience we have to change because we've optimized all those things that I just shared. I believe this is the frontier of a new medicine. This is the medicine of the future. This is where we're going. The understanding the power of the human heart is the new frontier because it has been left out of so many things in the past. The Institute of Heart Math has developed technology that helps us to know when we have this optimal connection. And you're looking at a, a computer printout screen of, of, one of, these, uh, uh, one of these pieces of software that allows us to do this. And, and the only reason I'm sharing this with you is because that I want you to know the technology now allows us to hone our abilities and to fine tune these abilities and where you're seeing the red line on the screen. Before the red line, you were seeing someone who is not in optimal coherence from the point they began to breathe and feel differently, I want you to see how quickly this can change. This is not edited. This is real-time data. This is how quickly we can change. And you see the change going into deep heart waves uh, that allow us to have this optimal experience. And at the lower right-hand side of the screen, you can see the coherence uh, that this person is creating between low, medium, and high. The longer they do the breathing and the feeling, the more of the green and the less of the red shows up. And these... Uh, this is one example of the kind of tools that are available for us to, to do this. Now, very quickly, all of this begins in the heart. And I think that's pretty obvious by now. Uh, it's all about what we call heart rate variability. Um, the distance between each heartbeat, the beat to beat variability, the peak that we see, each spike of a heartbeat is called the R wave. It's part of the QRS complex. The R is, is the peak that you're seeing. From one R wave to the next is a period of time shown in milliseconds. And in the screen, we're looking at 845 milliseconds. The next one's 745, 812, 732. The point here is that they're, they're close, but they're not exact. They're not the same. And that is the point, is that the time between each of our heartbeats is not the same. And it's a good thing that it's not. Because that variability from one beat to the next is what gives us our resilience to change in life. The variability from beat to beat, it's actually called heart rate variability, HRV. That variability gives us our resilience to life. When we're very young, we have tremendous variability. The number from one beat to the next, it changes with every beat when we first come into this world because we must be resilient to a new world that we're only beginning to understand. As we get older, we become set in our ways rigid in our thinking, and it's actually reflected in our heartbeat, and the time between the beats becomes more regular, and change becomes more difficult. The good news here is that everything we've just talked about, when we optimize this communication between the heart and the brain, it actually optimizes heart rate variability, it gives us more change, and that means we are now more resilient to life. So greater coherence does all those other good things, and greater coherence gives us optimal resilience to our time of extremes that we're talking about now. So we began this program about an hour ago by saying that big change in the world means big change in our lives. That's where you and I are today. I think it's fair to say the better we know ourselves, the better equipped we are to embrace whatever life brings to our door, the better we can embrace that big change in a healthy way. The change isn't gonna go away. We are living a time of extremes for our generation and probably for our children's, and that's why well, I wanted to start the program by saying the changes aren't temporary. We're living a new normal. So we can struggle against the new normal and cling to an old idea of an old world and an old way of healing and wait for that to come and experience the stress of that world not existing. Or we can embrace the beautiful new world and the new solutions that allow us to thrive in that world that are here now. Let the old world go and those old ideas. And I've just shared with you the science that gives us new ways of thinking, of moving from competition to cooperation, from separation to connection. Those are all the keys in helping us to embrace this change in a better way. The power of the human heart, I think this is the next frontier of health and healing. And if you haven't already, I think you're going to see more and more about this in some of the studies that I've shared with you today. But it shouldn't surprise you because it's instinctive. Almost universally, our elders and our most cherished spiritual traditions, our young people and our ancient 
religions, indigenous people, and practices from all over the world, intuitively, instinctively, we know that it's all about the heart. It's probably no accident then that the heart is the first organ to grow in your body when you're in your mother's womb. It's not the brain. The heart emerges first, and from the heart, then the signals began to give to begin to give other signals and other cells the instructions for how to build another you. So I'm going to close this program today with uh, another quote from a man that I have so much respect for, Buckminster Fuller. He died in 1983, and I never knew him. But the more I know about his work, the more I know that he was a man so far ahead of his time. He talked about change, and what he said is you never change things by fighting the existing reality. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. He says, if you want to do something new, if you want to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I think that's true for everything we do in life, and I can't think of a place where it would be even more true than the health model and the healing that is available to us in our lives and our world today. The integrative models of the best science, the best technology of the 20 and now the 21st century, married with 5,000 years of wisdom from those who have come before us who understood their bodies and their body's relationship to the world. When we marry those together and we embrace the concepts of cooperation between the cells of the body and between the organs of the body and the cooperation, the mutual aid that one organ gives to another, we begin to think of health and healing in a very, very different way. If you want to build something new, change something. You build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. So I want to thank you for all that you're doing to bring this new world into existence, to build the new model of living and thinking and healing that makes the old model obsolete. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for sharing and supporting this summit. This is no ordinary time in the history of our world. This is no ordinary summit, but we need you. Take good care. Join the quantum medicine movement. Speak with an admission advisor today.